Welcome back to What the Truck, man. Another session at the Enterprise Fleet Summit. It's been a great time. In case you missed the first one, I'm Dooner here with the dude, Michael Vincent. What have these people done to deserve the honor of two what the trucks <laughs> double dose? Me? Well, we are the logistics podcast uh, world champions. Uh, thank you, Trophy Smack, one more time for that belt. <laughs> Appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely awesome hey, stuff. It was great seeing Rob Hatchett up there just now yeah. talking about driver recruitment. You know, he was in this room back in October doing his TEDx Chattanooga speech, which was I was also a part of. If you notice when he's talking, he had all those chess boards behind him. Yeah. And that's exactly what his uh, TEDx Chattanooga was about. A lot of great sessions there. Uh, you folks should definitely check it out, especially Rob's and, and mine. Mine deals a little bit more with like addiction and those kind of struggles. But uh, it's a good time. Oh, maybe not that good of a time talking about it. It's, it's, it's definitely worth a watch. It's worth a watch. That's it's for worth sure. A, what was your takeaway from what they just said? Because Chris Torrance in the comments, he said, great session talking about one of the biggest bottlenecks in our industry, which is the uh, getting drivers in seats. Well, I mean, the, the biggest talk uh, takeaway was really confirming what we talked about before is that the, the application of transparency and honestly and open communication uh, and experience with customers, whether yeah. it be B2B or B2C, doesn't matter, is – it, it, it needs to be applied. Those same those same uh, uh, processes can be and should be applied to driver retention and driver and, and acquiring drivers. Yeah. Right. You know, it's interesting because this is a this event. We get to see the the sort of old bones that exist in freight and with legacy fleets and and just yeah. the old ways that we have of doing business. And it's so mired in our DNA that a lot of the things we do we continue to do just because we did them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're right. And now we're seeing sort of this hybrid of the industry. And, you know, that freight tech renaissance that started really in 2015, 2016, it's really ushering in. Yeah. And now we're we're trying to go through those growing pains and we're trying to get to, to a place where we can start running with all of this stuff. And I think we're getting really close, especially with some of the conversations I'm hearing today. We were talking about in our last sitting on here, connected data, managing that data. That's been a new yeah. problem, right? All right. these more data, more problems. And also you using that data to support drivers. I'm glad there's been so much talk about drivers and so much interest in this one. Seems like our heads are in the right direction. We're sticking to that theme of data though here in this segment as we cover tech solutions from outside of freight that our industry has adopted as well as the importance of weather data and fleet visibility. Very timely. Yeah, it certainly is. And if you look, you know, CBS News reported that the economic impact of Texas, the week-long freeze and power outages that went on, it could rival the damages caused by uh, some of the worst destructive hurricanes in U.S. Yeah. You don't think of a deep freeze in Texas as Katrina. <laughs> Hold on a second. Yeah. The economic impacts are still being calculated, but we're looking at 195 to $295 billion in lost income and economic production. I mean, if, to put that into perspective, for those of you out there, I mean, this was this seemed, uh, you know, it was it was it was a weather event. It happened. We're still seeing the effects in sonar. If you're a shipper out there, you looked at that and around February 18th before that swept through. You're like, oh, you know, rates are coming down yeah. a little bit, volumes are dropping a little bit, capacity's freeing up. All right, now maybe we can manage our <laughs> manage our freight spend a little bit better. Boom, disaster strikes. To put that in perspective, Hurricane Harvey and Katrina bolted $125 billion in physical damage. You just said $195 to $295 billion. Now, not necessarily in physical, but that's just in lost economic impact. Yeah, so, so two times, 2x yeah. on those hurricanes, right? And we were and we're sitting here talking about, wow, it sucks to have uh, deregulated power grids. Yeah. Because <laughs> your, your price might go up to $9,000 oh a gosh. kilowatt or whatever it was, right? That but was crazy. The impact was way way worse and uh you know even you know loves was talking about it earlier with zach yeah um about their impact of of that is still going on and they're still dealing to, still dealing with with the uh with the refineries that said are going offline yeah i mean port of houston not, not to mention the the impacts that are creating these backlogs right i mean so many people run in this just in time shipping approach that any delay can ripple all the way down to the customer oh yeah and it's, it's, you know, try ordering furniture right now. I actually lucked out. I ordered a couple of chairs for my new studio. Yeah. They, the site quoted me, though. They were preparing. They were they were tempering expectations. They said six to nine weeks. It arrived in like four days. But <laughs> I've heard other people saying they're trying to get lazy boys, right? They're trying to get, order a lazy boy recliner. They got to wait seven or eight months. And I was telling you earlier, I'm like an impulse buyer when I get a couch. I go in the store to get a pillow. I get up at the register and I'm like, you know what? I do need a shopping cart. Throw a couch in there. <laughs> I can use something to put this pillow on. <laughs> I can use something to put my butt in. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I think I will take a couch. That's that's not a bad idea. Hey, maybe our, a garage. <laughs> our next guest, he recognized this big problem, right, in terms of weather data. How do you mitigate weather data? How do you get ahead of weather data? Weathermen so maligned for always being wrong in their <laughs> data and in their predictions and all that stuff. Well, Scott, Scott uh, Perk, Perk Corillo, he's the founder and CEO of Weather Optics. He has been making weather maps since he was 10 years old. Later in life, he combined that passion with the passion every child in the Northeast has, school closures, and he made that No Snow app, which would predict school closures yeah. for parents. And then he realized his real opportunity. He found his stride, which was providing data to supply chain and to businesses to manage this weather-related risk. Scott, thank you for coming back on What the Truck. We're so excited to have you here. Hey, good to be back. Thanks for having me. Hey, I think we have a picture of that map that you made when you were 10, and this will help set the table for how far you've come along since then. I heard that's about as accurate as most weathermen on there. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing that you guys were able to find that map. Uh, you know, as a kid, instead of drawing, you know, stick figures and, and houses, I was drawing, you know, weather maps of the United States. So uh, not the most accurate map, but, uh, you know, it, it wasn't bad for, for a 10-year-old. That map is pretty solid, actually. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> and our own Zach Strickland, the Sultan of Sonar, he's yeah. a weather geek, yeah, a big time weather. So geek. he liked the map. I, I would, I would think an autographed picture of that would be a hell of a gift for him. Could be. Actually. <laughs> that thing is tremendous. That is absolutely true. So let's talk about some of these things. So, Thank like, you. delays are a big issue, right? Delays. No fleet wants to be delayed. We just talked about that just in time shipping. We talked about the astronomical impact that that Texas freeze had. Talk to us a little bit about what your, your data platform does and, help, and how that helps mitigate some of this. Yep, yep. So, weather related delays are, are you know, a huge issue for the trucking industry. Uh, 32 billion lost vehicle hours every year due to the weather. Uh, and this winter in particular was really bad. Uh, you know, you guys were just talking about the, the Texas winter storm. Uh, the core of our business is really producing these weather-adjusted ETAs. Uh, and what's cool about our software is we're actually able to look at a specific region uh, and see, you know, how many delays occurred uh, just from one particular storm. So for the Texas storm uh, specifically, we estimate there were 127 million lost vehicle hours and that it cost the trucking industry uh, about $8 billion. And, and fleets lose between $60 uh, and $100 per hour uh, on average from these weather-related delays. Uh, so cutting down delays or even just giving you know, companies awareness of them uh, can be a huge cost-saving metric. So, uh, Scott, you say that, uh, you know, the traditional weather data, uh, which, you know, your, the map we showed had traditional weather data. Sure. We know Alberta clippers come and nor'easters and cetera. Well, it, it's, it's not adequate to tell the full story and to predict what's going to happen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the real issue with traditional weather data um, is that it leaves a lot of costly guesswork, especially for transportation companies. Uh, companies really trying to figure out how weather is impacting different locations differently. Uh, and so what our weather-adjusted ETAs and our impact indices uh, really do is that they provide these actionable insights. So we'll tell you that you know, uh, Route A from Washington, D.C. to Boston uh, is going to see a 23% delay three days from now, or that you know, distribution center A is going to have a, a 45% chance of power outages. Um, and so this really allows companies to focus on the, the mitigation piece uh, of weather. Uh, and, you know, one of our bigger clients is, uh, is a meal kit delivery company. They have shipments all over the country. Uh, and in two weeks over the winter, during the peak of, of winter weather, uh, they saved almost $400,000 from this type of information. So weather data is much more powerful when it is uh, into, turned into impact information. So speaking of the data, you don't use all of the traditional sources. You're also using some unorthodox methods and, and data sources. Tell us about that. Yeah. So the way we're really able to make these granular and accurate forecasts is actually by using uh, really good non-weather data. So ground truth impact data that we can kind of uh, apply machine learning to. Uh, so I'll give you one good example. Uh, we just you know, signed a partnership with a company called Autonomo. Uh, they're a vehicle data company. Uh, we now have access to tens of millions of points of historical vehicle data. Uh, so we apply weather to that. And then on top of that, we apply things like uh, industrial landscape, uh, distance from river, tree height and density. Uh, and, and these are things that you wouldn't think uh, apply to freight. Uh, but these kind of nuanced interactions are actually really important. And, and that's really how we create our forecast. So why tree height? Is it because it might fall and block a road? Like distance to river, maybe flooding? Why some of those sources? Yep. Yeah, so, you know, tree height, for example, uh, just like you said, uh, you know, the chances of trees coming down due to the weather, uh, you know, we, we do things like power outage forecasts, uh, we do overall business disruption, 
Uh, so these kind of non-weather data variables are super important to getting those granular forecasts right. Uh, if we're going to predict for you know a given city or a given neighborhood that the power outage chances are going to be you know 60 percent, we're taking into account all of this non-weather data and uh, and tree height is one of the variables that we that we definitely look at. That makes perfect sense, you know, because there's a there's an effect here called the the Chattanooga effect that absolutely happens, <laughs> right? Wait, what is the Chattanooga? I, I've lived here long enough to know that the weather coming across that the Cumberland Plateau coming out here, when it hits that edge just west of me, it changes the weather immediately. Wow. When it hits there, there's absolutely talk to Nick Austin about it. there's absolutely because of the <laughs> landscape and topography that we have that things definitely change. So uh, let me let me ask you this. When you're when you're looking and using the weather to adjust your ETAs, how important it is is it to really look at that weather uh, as far as predicting arrival of freight, et cetera? Yeah, so it's it's super important, and, and we take the accuracy of our data really seriously. Um, so we we did a recent uh, case study right before actually the three PL summit, uh, and we looked at our, our ETA data, and we found that during disruptive weather events, we were improving ETA accuracy uh, by twenty five percent during severe weather events by up to fifty eight percent. Uh, and we were beating these top routing providers 90% of the time. Uh, so this data is not really just about, you know, rerouting or cutting down on delays, uh, but it's also just about giving companies awareness of delays so they can prepare. Uh, there's a big difference between, you know, expected and unexpected delays, uh, both both operationally uh, and financially. So it, it's really two aspects uh, of, of improving EPAs, one cutting down uh, on delays and the other is just to be aware of them. Wow. So, uh, do you have any like examples of anyone who's been using this data and has been been able to increase their efficiency? Uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, we we have a, a few meal kit delivery companies who have been using the data. Uh, you know, shipments all over the country. What they're doing with that data uh, is alerting their carriers of when they want shipments moved up uh, or changed. They're also alerting their customers uh, of of when shipments might be delayed, and they're improving that customer retention. Uh, we're also working with a few supply chain visibility companies that are directly improving their ETAs. Um, so, so those are our kind of two main use cases right now. Wow, you know, this is a uh, this is a product that is near and dear to you. Mentioned Zach Strickland oh, yeah. and, and someone cool. like um, Stone Cold Nick Austin who works here yeah. as well. Nick Austin, he's always writing these articles about best weather related movies, and I know you're passionate. Mm -hmm. You've written blogs and stuff. So before I let you go, I got to ask you, what is the best? Maybe not the most accurate, but what's the best weather related movie? The movie that I, I always go back to, and it's probably not the most accurate, but uh, The Day After Tomorrow, which I believe was on Nick Austin's list, uh, but, but fantastic movie, the, the craziest weather uh, I think I've seen in a movie. So that, that's my go-to. Man, I see, I consider like Twister a, a like a modern classic, but they, there's one in Twister's 2014 that came yeah. out called Into the Storm, and it even had a fire tornado in it. 2014 it came out. It, I don't know if it did very well, but I think it's pretty good. All right. I my my go to is uh, Sharknado. Sharknado, yeah. Imagine, Sharknado. imagine yeah, that. Classic. <laughs> Scott, where do people go to, to reach out and learn more and and jump into your this passion bucket you have for weather? You've been doing this. People have to understand this. He's been doing this since he was ten years old. I, I saw that. The evidence. Yes, yeah, is... true. I'm a true true weather nerd. Uh, you can find out more about us uh, by visiting weatheroptics.co. Uh, you could Google us. You can reach out to me directly, Scott Peckerella at weatheroptics.co. Uh, would love to talk about anything weather. Thank you so much, Scott. Have a great day. Hey, come out Thank here to have. F3, too. Come out here November 8th to 10th. We'll get to meet you in person, man. It'll be about time. It'll be awesome if we see you. Take it easy. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. We want all of you to come out, too. Come out to F3 November 8th to 10th. Go to live.freightwaves.com. Get a ticket. Use code WTT. You'll get 200 bucks off on us. Treat yourself. Treat yourself to a nice meal down here. That yeah, 200 bucks. Yeah. Now we're going to talk to Jake Fields. He's the co-founder and CTO of Platform Science. He's also a Drexel University Dragon, home to other alumni like Paul Barron, one of the founding fathers of the internet and one of the innovators of the packet switching network, and Norman Joseph Woodland, the innovator of barcode technology. Wow. Jake, thanks for joining us. Oh. I, I didn't know we had such a uh, wonderful history there. <laughs> Did, so one of the things I read about your school was tradition suggests people would rub the toe of a bronze water boy to get better grades. Is this something you'd ever uh, participated in? We, we had a big dragon mascot. It was quite scary, actually. So you wanted to stay away from that. So I uh, don't know about the water boy, but um, <laughs> him and the dragon are probably good buddies. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit. Let's talk about technology that has found its way into trucking, but has been working well in, in other fields. Um, what are some of the opportunities that we've been seeing there as we integrate it into trucking? What are some of the challenges? 
Yeah, I mean, I think as you uh, as we've evolved within the trucking space, uh, cloud's been a, a huge area where there's been a lot of up and coming movement, right? So a huge opportunity. Uh, now all of a sudden we're able to connect all these different clouds together to create integrated services. Um, but it's also a lot of work and a lot of burden for the fleets. Um, they've gone from an on-prem world um, into a cloud world. Um, it needs to be 24 seven operable, um, a higher level of efficiency than uh, ultimately the consumer world. And, and I, gives them the opportunity to really excel in terms of what they're doing, but it's really a matter of how do you deliver that important back office data down to the fleets, right? How do you do that in real time? And how do you deliver mission critical information into a really powerful driver experience? Everyone here is talking about efficiency in terms of lots of data. You got to get the right data to your drivers so they can deliver the right data back to you to really manage that fleet going forward. Yeah, so so what are some of those challenges that are that are, that come along with adoption of the cloud technology? Like uptime has got to be incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, uh, uptime's huge. Um, as we know, even the major infrastructure providers have challenges. Uh, on top of that, you really need to decide what should live in the cloud and, and what should live in the edge. Um, there's critical information in the vehicle um, that really shouldn't be dependent on the cloud. So compliance data, vehicle faults, uh, critical events, uh, different types of safety alerts, those are all necessary in real time. So uptime's a big, it's, it's really a matter of deciding how do you compute the right information in the right location. So Jake, you, you mentioned a term called uh, what should live in a cloud and what should live on the edge. What, mm -hmm. Define the edge, I, I'm not familiar. Yeah, so I mean, we have connected vehicles now, right? They're smart, they have the ability to actually do computation within there. So they're bringing in CAN bus data, they're bringing in different information from sensor devices all around the world, uh, all within the physical world, sorry. And, it's an opportunity to decide what is data, ultimately what's information that you want to send back to the cloud and, and how does that provide insights for the actual operators and the fleet back end. Drivers like everyone else can exist in a connected mobile world, right? So how do all of these technologies come together and do they translate well to that mobile world? I mean, drivers are finally getting modern devices, which is great, um, but like I said, it's not just that mobile device now, all of a sudden it's this vehicle data that needs to come together with these sensors. Um, fleet shouldn't really need to worry about that. Um, really they need to figure out how are they ultimately delivering software? So whether it's the fleets or the app developers, everything just needs to work in the vehicle. They need to be able to go ahead and put a driver in a truck, deliver applications. Um, and that's been a huge opportunity for our fleets and our, our partners that we've been working with because they've been able to introduce new software, new levels of inf uh, innovation based on having a new connected truck, this mobile device that works seamlessly with all the different sensors around it, and ultimately allow that driver to have a better experience and optimize you know, how they work from a day-to-day -day perspective. So Jake, how important is it to, to, to look to the driver for inspiration and or the motivation for, for these applications in this development? I mean, I, I think we all know drivers have had many pain points over the years, so fleets have been really responsive to that lately. Um, I think there's a lot more attention to doing uh, driver studies, uh, driving along with drivers to understand where are those pain points. And they're the same pain points that the fleets are seeing, but there's a better appreciation when you're hands-on with those users. Um, ultimately, you're getting better feedback and, and fleets are able to now push software in real time. Before they would update the software uh, within their vehicles that the drivers are using you know, a few times a year. Now we're seeing that happen on a weekly basis so they can adapt really quickly both to driver feedback and ultimately changes within the market. When did you start noticing those those big changes where they're getting it more ahead of doing these updates to their systems? Um, I think that push has really been happening over the past few years. Uh, again, once you went into kind of modern um, prosumer type tablets, um, it opened up that opportunity. Once you ended up with um, embedded devices within the vehicle that had the ability to do over the air updates, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that a vehicle had to pull into a depot and get a USB stick upgrade to be able to do that. And it just wasn't economical to be able to do that on a regular basis. So those over the air technologies are huge and they're going to continue to push things forward very, very quickly as we continue to move into that connected space. You know, Michael, we've been hearing about that 3G sunset, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, J Jake, are you familiar with that at all? And is, is there, um, are, are a lot of systems at risk with this? We're just starting to learn about it. 
Yeah, um, thankfully for, for some fleets, the, the dates have been pushed back a little bit um, with the, the world that we've had over the past year or so. Um, but yeah, it, it really just requires swapping out technologies. In many cases, it's actually a blessing in disguise. It's an opportunity for fleets to do a refresh, to get more modern devices in there, whether those are from cameras to hubs that live within the vehicle, that are allow them to be able to operate for many years going forward, as opposed to you know having to update that or decide when it's slowed down enough where they can't really operate their fleet or give an efficient driver experience. So while it's a huge cost driver, um, I, I sympathize with the fleets on that. It's an opportunity to take a step back, take a look at the overall fleet strategy and decide how do I want to go forward, not just for my drivers today, but ultimately over the next five or 10 years. So, Jake, as I'm listening to you talk about this, I can't help but relate this back to some topics, well, that we've been talking about throughout this entire uh, summit, but beyond is, is driver retention, driver recruiting, right? And and so when you're looking at this, these applications that you're talking about here, is it fair to say that these can be used uh, not only for the, the fleet maintenance and utilization and the efficiencies that are there, but really for, uh, you know, the, the life of the driver, for the retention of that driver, for the recruitment of those drivers through the use of these technologies? Yeah, I mean, take, listen to some of the sessions about uh, driver recruiting, driver retention. It, it's a huge opportunity, and we're already seeing huge benefits there. Drivers are being trained now uh, with modern applications and, and modern systems, and, and that allows them to feel more empowered to do their job. They're coming into a richer ecosystem of different applications, um, and that's ultimately where the fleets were looking to get. They just had technology barriers before. So, you know, we've all expected this within the personal world. You know, drivers do have smartphones now. They expect a whole suite of different applications that they flip to. Now fleets are using more and more applications, and those are across all the different categories. Like you're saying, there's fleet-developed applications. You have shipper applications. Uh, they're pushing down applications from HR. Um, there's TSP apps like your compliance, your safety, your navigation, and then a whole range of partners from the video providers, the rail yards, the weight stations. We're seeing things within uh, personal fitness and wellness that all drive into that driver experience and how do they ultimately operate that vehicle more efficiently, but do their job from a day-to-day -day perspective. If you flip around your phone, your computer, you don't use one or two apps. You have a lot of different software and ultimately there's a lot of industry partners right now that are delivering great software. They're looking at these driver pain points. So fleets don't have to solve it on their own, but fleets need the ability to manage all this software, ultimately from one location, deploy it down to their drivers and make sure these applications work together seamlessly. So it's about the content, but it's also about delivery and ultimately how does that experience function from a day-to-day -day perspective and as, as drivers over the road. Jake, thank you so much for your time today. People who want to dive deeper into this, they want to take advantage of all that Platform Science offers, where should we send them to? Yeah, platformscience.com. So uh, we uh, can be reached there. Uh, come on down to San Diego or visit us uh, anywhere else throughout the country and uh, definitely open to chat. Jake, you and the team coming to F3 in November? Of course. Oh, we not miss it. We'll see you there. We'll see you there. Take it easy. Right. Thank you. Looking good. You know, we talk a lot about tech. Tech has yeah. been a huge theme, uh, a huge theme at this, but yeah, tech opens the opportunity. Now, unsecure tech uh, opens the opportunity for, for cybercrime, right? We hear about so many ransomware yeah. attacks. You mean people will take advantage of this? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So we yeah. were talking about the, the What the Truck newsletter. What the Truck yeah. newsletter comes out every Tuesday. Go to FreightWaves.com slash WTT. You can sign up for it there. Obviously, it is free. Um, it has all new information and content that we don't cover in the show. Whatever right. uh, whatever the soup du jour is of, of a Tuesday. Well, the soup du jour yesterday was this $1 trillion web of cybercrime. I'm kind of blown away by the statistic. Wow. I'm also blown away that, so internet traffic was up 50% over the past year, right? Everyone's going that online, they need information. That's not shocking. They're yeah. buying, yeah, not, that's, not, that's not the shocking part. Yeah. What is shocking though, is that fraud spiked 50% as well. So cyber criminals are keeping pace with the growth of internet usage. They're not being left behind at all. No, they're not. And, and it's also 69% increase in the average value of the attempt. Yeah, they're attempt going bigger, right? Purchase. Yeah, they're going bigger and badder. And more often. They're going bigger, badder, more often. But here's the other startling thing that should have your spider senses tingling. Transportation was the top targeted vertical with an 8.4 increase in hacking attempts in 2020 compared to 2019. Strift, Brian Strait in his article on this, he reported that SIFT estimates more than $1 trillion was left globally in 2020 due to cyber time with Ransomware attacks rising 40% and email delivered malware attacks 
climbed about 600 per 600 percent, folks. 600 percent from 2019. Last year there was obviously those major ransomware attacks yeah. against what TQL, TFI International, Dasky, Ford Air, CMA, CGM, and this year we've had a number as well, and we're only going to have more. It's it's unbelievable, and I mean. 8.4% increase in the attempts in 2020 and 2019. And transportation is one that they're going after. Is it because they think that we're so far behind in this I think industry? So. Is that what it is? They think that there's so many players out there that they can just... I mean, two reasons, uh, right? First of yeah. all, we are an industry that it can be easily crippled by things like ransomware attacks. Well, nope. And it cripples more than just the industry, right? Yeah. It cripples the entire economy. You shut down forward air for two weeks, a lot of people hurt. There's a lot of invested people that want it to be solved, right? So yeah. the ransomware attack is a... I mean, you're right. I mean, would that be the motivation? I don't know. Here's the thing, too. Like with the Suez Canal thing, you know, if you're if you're a hacker out there, if I, you know, I'll throw my hood up, I'll be a, I'll be a hacker right now. <laughs> if I'm a hacker, I'm like, you're losing four hundred billion dollars a day in freight just because that, that's how much goods are on here. Yeah, that seems like a prime target for disruption. Cargo ships, trucks. I mean, all of these things. And they're 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 realizing that hackers are realizing it. Yeah, they certainly are. So, man, cybersecurity, unbelievable. I can't a trillion dollars. And it's only going to grow. But what's so startling is just how much it grew in one year. And, you know, it's something that we opined at the beginning of this thing on what the truck, when we sent, when we sent everyone remote, we're like, this is great. But the one bad thing is this is really going to open the door for hacking. and People are going to get backdoors into companies because just the way we have to move information to, around yeah, yeah. between yeah. one another. We have to communicate, opens us up to that, to that cyber thing. Wasn't it Gene Sirocco? Wasn't it, wasn't it like 49 million attacks or something like yeah. that in L.A.? And he Some, said that that number will something? only grow by the time he's done finishing the sentence. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Hey, Friday on What the Truck, as we mentioned, if you enjoyed this podcast, we are on three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, noon Eastern time, live on Freightways TV, Freightways LinkedIn, Freightways Facebook. This Friday, we're back to a regular scheduled program. We've got a brand new show coming at you. Mm. We're going to be looking at innovation and adoption of Freight Tech in 21, automating the back office, and a preview of our newest podcast, The Stockout, plus much more, all the news and all that. We're going to have Eric Rampell. He's the Chief Innovation Officer and Michael Reed, Chief Product Officer over at Redwood. Oh, Logistics. We got Josh Ashbury. He's been a regular on the show. He's the vice president over at Hubtran. We got Leo Gordinsky. He's a CTO at Alves. And we got Mike Budendistel. Buden, Budendistel, right? I got that right. Uh, yeah. Market yeah. expert at Freightways talking about his brand new show. Folks, you want this on audio? Look up What the Truck on your favorite podcast player of choice or look up Freightcast. And you'll get every single Freightways podcast all in one feed, including all the sessions from today's event. In fact, including all the sessions from every event we've ever done, every show we've ever done. It's all on one feed. It's all the same price. Go to live.freightways.com. Get that F free ticket. Save yourself $200 and do it now or after the show. Hey, hang right. out. Stick with us. Truck Talk's coming up with Alan Adler and Sam Abdi. And then when we close the show, we'll give that Roomba away and give our best in show. Don't go anywhere. Peace and love.